Peace be with you, and welcome to The Word Unveiled. This program is a a production of St. Malachi Church in Sterling Heights, Michigan. St. Malachi, along with St. Paul of Tarsus, St. Ronald, and St. Thecla, are churches in the Central Macomb Vicariate Family of Parishes No. 5 in the Archdiocese of Detroit. Father Joseph Gimbala is our moderator. My name is Gordon Peck. I'm the Director of Evangelization Programs for Adults at St. Malachi. As in all things, let us begin in prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Gracious and most merciful God, give us ears to hear your words, a mind to comprehend your meaning, and hearts that will allow your word to take root in our lives. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. So our program is the Fathers of the Church, part two. We're going to uh, study the lives of St. Basil the Great, all the way up to St. Isidore of uh, Seville. So St. Basil the Great uh, lived in Cappadocia. That's the eastern part of Turkey. uh, And his family had become wealthy and influential. So he was treated to the very best education. And after he got all the education he could find in Cappadocia, he was sent to Athens for additional instruction. And in Athens, he met an old childhood friend from Cappadocia, Gregory of Nazianus. And they also met the very tiresome nephew of Emperor Constantine Julian, and Julian will become the the emperor and be Julian the apostate, so he's not a friend of the church. Returning to Cappadocia after his education, Basil became a successful civic leader, and he would have continued as such if not for Macrina, who was his sister. So here's a map that shows where Cappadocia is. Uh, Asia Minor is essentially where the nation of Turkey is. You see the Black Sea above, in the Mediterranean Sea to the south. Cappadocia is in the eastern part of the uh, country, and the city of Caesarea is in the center of Cappadocia. You also see south of that is Antioch, and uh, and then Ephesus, uh, where John was bishop, and then Constantinople, where the emperors reigned from, and then way off to the west is Athens. So Basil was one of 10 children in his family, and his sister Macrina, she dedicated herself to the ascetic life. She forswore marriage. She dedicated herself to a life of prayer. And she soon influenced Basil to amend his ways. And this is what he wrote about it. He says, I had wasted much time on follies and spent nearly all my youth in vain labors and devotion to the teachings of a wisdom that God had made foolish. Suddenly I awoke as out of a deep sleep. I beheld the wonderful light of the gospel truth, and I recognized the nothingness of the wisdom of the princes of this world that was to come to naught. I shed a flood of tears over my wretched life, and I prayed for a guide who might form in me the principles of piety. So Basil now traveled again, and this time for spiritual education. So he went to Egypt, and he sought out the desert hermits. So there were many um, uh, holy men who had went into into the Egyptian desert and lived in caves um, by themselves as hermits. So Basil goes to learn from them. Now, St. Athanasius that we talked about in the last program, he was in that region during one of his exiles at this time, but it's never been established if Basil and Athanasius ever met. Nevertheless, Basil would always praise and revere Athanasius and his theology, so he would quote him many, many times. So when Basil returned to Cappadocia, he took his brother Peter and he went into the remote lands to establish a religious community for contemplation. So he's going to do the same thing he saw happening in Egypt. He wants to do it back in Cappadocia. And his sister, Macrina, the the holy one, along with their widowed mother and many other women, set up a convent nearby. And soon many men and women came to these communities. So So Basil has a community and his sister has a community and people of of faith are flocking to them. And as a part of that effort, Basil wrote the first monastic rule for communities and he set a pattern for others. And this is way before the time of St. Benedict. So Basil was now content to live out his life in this remote religious community away from the cares of the world. But after only five years, His old friend, Gregory of Nazianus, was sent to find him and bring him back to the provincial capital. The emperor Valens was pushing an Arian agenda, 
and he sought to exile all pro-Nicene bishops in favor of the Arians. So the Arian heresy, as we recall, was a, a belief that Jesus was a man who was merely given special powers by God. And so it, was, it did not believe in the Trinity, uh, Trinitarian God. And so the emperor had, was not a Christian, but now is switching to become an Arian. So Gregory of Nazianus is recruiting uh, the help of his old buddy Basil to fight back against this. So soon after his uh, arrival in Cappadocia, the bishop died, and Basil was made bishop in his place. So this delighted Athanasius, but it angered Valens. And uh, who made plans to have Basil exiled or brought around to the Arian side. Well, Emperor Valens was used to dealing with flatterers whose only ambition was to produce uh, or protect their own positions. He had a lot of yes men around him. So at this time, the church in the East was intricately caught up in imperial politics. So the church in the East was all around Constantinople, that church in there. The churchmen could not necessarily be relied upon to be faithful. They might be more political. So Emperor Valens, thinking this way, sent his henchman Modestus to procure Basil's submission and acceptance of the Arian heresy. He was not prepared for the response he was going to get from Basil. When God is endangered and exposed, there are all other th- all other things are considered to nothing. Him alone do we look to. Fire, swords, beasts, and instruments for tearing the flesh are wished for by us as delights more than horrors. Afflict us with such tortures, threaten, do all that you can now devise, enjoy your power. Also let the emperor hear this, that at all events you will not persuade us nor win us over to the impious doctrine of Arianism, though you threaten with cruel deeds. Well, Modestus was taken aback by this, and he remarked that no one had ever spoken to him like that. And Basil responded, perhaps you have never met a bishop before. So, Here's the diagram of the Trinity. We see the the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not the Father. But the Father is God. The Son is God. The Holy Spirit is God. In other words, our God is a triune God, three divine persons in one Trinity. And what were they up against? They're up against Arianism. And here's sort of a diagram for Arianism. Arianism believes in God, the Father who created the Son to use the Holy Spirit as a force. So, Um, there's nothing consubstantial. It violates the Nicene Creed. It's not uh, Orthodox Christianity. And this is how the world kind of uh, played out in the year 500. The tan-colored areas in the Eastern Roman Empire are those which are um, truly Christian. Uh, They're they're, uh, uh, faithful to the Chalcedon uh, councils. And in the in the West, in the, the purple areas, you see Italy and Spain and parts of France. These are Visigoths and Ostrogoths and all these uh, uh, tribes from Europe have invaded Rome, but they also have picked up Aryan and uh, the Aryan form of Christianity, and they are uh, they're Aryan nations. So this is what the uh, Basil and uh, all his friends were up against. So Basil worked as a good pastor. He, remember, he's the bishop now. And he helped the poor, and he fed the hungry, and he cared for the sick, and he opened hospitals uh, when such were largely unknown and very scarce. He became much loved and respected by his flock. And Modestus, the henchman of Emperor Valens, um, he told him that the only violence would rid him of Basil's influence. But, But Valens did not take that advice. Instead, he wanted to hear this Basil. He wanted to hear him himself. So he went and he listened to a homily, and after he heard the homily, he quietly dropped his plan to exile Basil. In fact, he continued, uh, he contributed to charities that Basil had established. So the emperor is being won over. In the battle with the Arians, that's a debating battle, a uh, spiritual battle, Basil worked tireless to explain and convince good men and women of the truth as taught by the priests and bishops who advanced the Trinitarian understanding of God. And he was very successful and many returned to the true faith. So what is his legacy? Well, Basil expressed a strong preference for monastic life as contrasted with that of the hermits. And he also defended reading of pagan philosophers in the light of the true faith. So he felt that there was some truth in philosophy, but it needed to be understand, understood through the, through the faith of Christ. And, and, and Basil spoke and wrote extensively against the Arian heresy and in favor of orthodoxy. 
He composed a beautiful liturgy that's still in use in the Eastern churches. And his writings are treasured by both the Eastern and Western churches, and he's venerated as a saint in both. Basil died as the Bishop of Caesarea in Cappadocia in 379 AD at the age of 48. Now let's talk about his friend, St. Gregory of Nazianus. He was born in 330, and he's, uh, without a doubt, the most reluctant of all the church fathers. He met Basil in early childhood when they were at school in Athens, and the two became fast friends for life. Gregory went to study in Athens. Uh, His father was also named Gregory, and he wanted him to enter religious life. Uh, Eastern priests often married in this time, so that's why his father was a priest, while the Western priests did not. And shortly after his return to Cappadocia, Gregory learned that Basil's new monastery had been established and he eagerly wanted to be part of it. So he wanted to retreat into a quiet, pious, prayerful life. And he was delighted with the seclusion and peace of the monastery, but it wasn't going to last. His ailing father sent for him, and then he forced Gregory to be ordained to the priesthood against his will. In reaction to this event, Gregory soon decided to abandon his new position and go back to Basil's monastery. He was just going to walk away from it. But many, including Basil himself, told him, no, 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 you've got to return. You're a priest now. You have a parish. You have to go back. And so he reluctantly went back. And not long after this, Gregory was called to assist the beleaguered Orthodox ministry in Constantinople that was once again under attack by the Arians at every level in the church in the government, and in society. And Constantinople had long been captive to the intrigues of the Arian bishops at this time, so Gregory's preaching of the Orthodox faith caused a considerable amount of tension amongst all in the city. His success, however, in bringing people back to Orthodoxy came just in time for the installation of Theodosius, a new Orthodox emperor. So the emperor is now gonna be a Christian. But the political climate of Constantinople was not to his liking, and after this is Gregory's liking, and after two years, he returned to his original church in Nazianus. And then two years after that, he retired to his family's estate to write and to pray, where he peacefully died in 390 AD. What's his legacy? Well, when Theodosius became the emperor, he wanted to cast out all the Arian influences in the church, so he called a council to hammer out the differences. And the subject of the Holy Spirit seemed to divide many priests and bishops. Gregory was chosen to preside over the council. Basil had passed on to be with the Lord by this time. But their joint words and phraseology were added to the creed. And this is what they wrote. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son and is jointly worshipped and jointly glorified, who spoke through the prophets. Very close to the words that we have in the Nicene Creed. Today And so they, so um, Basil had talk, spoken with Gregory before his death, and they had composed those words. This brings us to another Gregory. This is Gregory of Nyssa. He's the third of the great Cappadocian uh, fathers, and he was the younger brother of Basil and Macrina, their sister. And they were also friends of Gregory of Nazianus. But one could say that Basil was the doer, Gregory of Nazianus was the dreamer, and Gregory of Nyssa, he's the thinker. So he was appointed at a young age as a lector in the church, but he soon fell away from any religious conviction, unfortunately like so many young people do, but he came back. Uh, But before that, he married and he became a teacher of rhetoric, that is public speaking, but he found the life kind of dull and boring, and his friend Gregory of Nazianus often spoke to him about the religious life, so when Gregory of Nyssa's wife died, he decided to join his brother's monastery, and the three friends were all together in one place for a while. Now, Basil, as the abbot, ordered his younger brother, first as a priest and then as the bishop of Nyssa, uh, a small town in Armenia, where the Arians were in the ascendancy. He he ordained him. And then Gregory uh, turned out to be a poor administrator, and his financial mismanagements made for even worse relations with the Arians, who had him deposed in 376. But Gregory of Nyssa is noted more for his writings and what he thought than for any deed that he did as priest or bishop. He wove the writings of Origen 
and Plato into deep works of systematic and mystical theology. So he'll be a a precursor to St. Augustine. He wrote biblical commentaries, books on apologetics, and numerous letters to individuals on many religious and spiritual matters. And he wrote a biography on his sister Macrina that explained the contributions of women, quite unheard of at the time, but the contributions of women, especially virgins and widows in the early church. And his work was so influential that the Second Council of Nicaea, which occurred in 680 to 681, called Gregory of Nyssa the father of the fathers. Our next father of the church is St. John Chrysostom. Now, he was born to a pious widow. His father died before his birth in Antioch in 347 AD. And he studied law and rhetoric, public speaking. But he he was tired of academics, and he was attracted to a life of solitary contemplation in the wilderness. He's a little bit like Gregory of Nyssa here. His mother objected, saying she did not wish to become a widow yet again. But John, however, persevered until his health began to suffer from the deprivations that were part of this lifestyle. So he returned to Antioch, and he was ordained a deacon in 381 AD, and then a priest six years later. In Antioch, he became a re- renowned for his preaching, and he was assigned to many of the most prestigious churches. He had an elegant way of expressing the most compelling messages, and this earned him the name Chrysostom, which means golden-tongued. And he won much acclaim throughout Syria, and one day he received a summons to go to Constantinople to become the patriarch of that city. He thought to decline the honor. He didn't want that much involvement, but he received word that the emperor was sending an armed escort to come and get him. So in in Constantinople, John found a demoralized clergy. Many were falling into serious sin, and they were overwhelmed by political controls on their work. So the government was controlling the church instead of the other way around. John set about reforming the clergy, and this found favor with many, but it also antagonized others, including the empress Eudocia. Now, he also found an enemy in Archbishop Theophilus of Alexandria, who incited other bishops to rally against John's reforms and have him deposed. So we have problems in the church. Theophilus got his way, and in 403, John was exiled. But the empress, of all people, had him returned. And a year later, he preached against the games held in the city and a silver statue that was erected to Eudocia, almost like she was a god. And this time, she got upset again, and he was exiled to Armenia. In Armenia, he continued to preach about the proper conduct of a pious person, and he encountered many new enemies. The Lord said, if they've hated me, they'll hate you too. So the emperor had him exiled to a remote wilderness near the Black Sea, where there he died. What is his legacy? Well, the Pope and the Western Church broke off communion with all the churches in the East that had exiled John and contributed to his death. So they were very upset about what had happened, and they only restored communication with them when they repented. Remember, the Pope is the bishop of uh, of Rome and the leader of the church. So when John's body was brought back to Constantinople for burial, the son of Eudicia, the empress, the new emperor, Theodosius II, publicly asked forgiveness for his mother's actions. Quite an extraordinary event. And at the Council of Chalcedon, uh, Chalcedon, In 451, John Chrysostom was declared a father of the church very early, 451. In 1568, he was named a doctor of the church. And in 1908, Pope Pius X designated him the patron saint of Christian orators, preachers, and speakers, the golden ton John Chrysostom. Our next father is St. Jerome of Stryden. Jerome was born in the Roman province of Dalmatia, which we would now call Croatia, uh, north of Greece, in 342 AD. His literary genius and abrasive personality would both open and close doors all his life. He was a very intelligent man, but he had a tongue in him that would just cut the wrong way. Uh, He traveled to Rome, and he studied grammar and rhetoric, but he soon decided to abandon his pursuits uh, in, in, in favor of a civil service career, or rather, he abandoned the civil service career and he returned to the faith. 
So Jerome and some of his companions to try the monastic life in Dalmatia. So he's going to do pretty much what uh, Basil had done, but up in uh, Dalmatia. But Jerome's critical comments of others didn't cause things not to work, fall apart, and he decided to try it again in the Middle East. <clears throat> well, while, while traveling, Jerome learned both Hebrew and the Greek languages, so he was a very smart man. And a chance meeting with Gregory of Nazianus introduced him to the writings of Origen. And in 380, Jerome returned to Rome, and he became an, o, an, an, aide, to Pope, to, an aide to Pope Damasus, who commissioned him to revise and update the Latin Vulgate Gospels. So some of the Gospels had been, the Gospels had been written in Latin, but not the entire Bible. So Jerome was attracted, uh, he attracted a number of aristocratic women, mostly virgins and widows, who were tutored by him. And these women established house monasteries and supported Jerome financially in many of his projects. And he always had many projects going. While Jerome was appreciated by these women, he had a habit of aggravating many priests, and he gained many new enemies. And that seems to be, and he seemed to be oblivious of that fact, because when Pope Damasus died, Jerome fully expected that he would be elected pope, but this was not to be. And Jerome decided to return again to the Middle East. And there he established a monastic community in Bethlehem where he set about to translate all of the books of the Bible into Latin. And what's his legacy? Well, he wrote commentaries on the prophets and he preached sermons to those all around him in Bethlehem. He corrected many clergy who should have known scripture better but then Jerome translated all scripture into Latin. And the Vulgate Bible, and that is the script, um, all scripture, Old Testament and New, in Latin was an invaluable aid to the embattled clergy of the Western Church who would endure the Dark Ages just a few years after Jerome's death. And the Vulgate Bible would serve the faithful for over 1,500 years. And Jerome said, ignorance of scripture is ignorance of Christ. St. Jerome, or excuse me, St. Ambrose of Milan is our next church father. The Emperor Diocletian reorganized the empire, and one of the things he did was that he made the city of Milan more important than the city of Rome. The, the Roman seat had moved to uh, Constantinople by this time. Rome is becoming less important, and the city of Milan started to become more important. So Ambrose, who was born to a wealthy family, it's a lot like some, many more of the church fathers. He had a sister, Marcelina, who received the veil of a consecrated virgin from the Pope at St. Peter's Basilica. So he has a holy sister. And Ambrose and his brother, Satyrus, they uh, went into public service, and Ambrose soon became the governor of this new Milan region for the emperor. But within a year of this, Ambrose faced a daunting challenge of keeping peace between the Arians and the Catholics. So there's the her heretical and orthodox forces at play in, in the city of Milan. And one day, as Ambrose was trying to stave off violence between the Arians and the Catholics over the choice of the next bishop, all in the crowd began chanting, Ambrose for bishop. Of course, Ambrose expected that the emperor would veto such a suggestion. He did not think that he would go along with it, but he was so surprised he did. And in fact, the emperor thought it was a great idea and he endorsed it. So on December 7th, in the year 374, Ambrose was ordained a bishop. He wasn't even a priest before that, so he had to be made a priest and a bishop. And he was given all the uh, um, orders that he, he needed. And because Ambrose was an educated man, fluent in Greek as well as Latin, he could read all the writings of the Greek fathers, and their theology began to find fertile ground in the West. So unlike the conditions in the East, Ambrose resisted any association between emperor and the church. In the East, it was all politics. Ambrose is now going to try to cut that off. He maintained if, there, if, that, if any should be subservient, it should be the emperor and the government. In other words, the church should be above the government, not the other way around like it was in the East. Now, the Empress Justina, who happened to be an Arian, attempted to control Ambrose and the churches. She failed, and Ambrose introduced the earliest written form of music in the church. Before this, church music was not uh, part of the, of the, the mass, it wasn't part of uh, uh, the celebration because uh, pagans had used music in their, in their uh, liturgical events. So this is the first time that music starts to come into the mass. 
And when some Romans were captured by invading Visigoths, Ambrose melted down gold chalices to pay for the ransoms to return these captives. And ironically, some of the Arians around him accused him of sacrilege in doing that. And while Ambrose did not leave an extensive uh, library of writings like many of the church fathers, he has come to be known for his faithful living in the spirit of the Nicene Creed and preserving the faith in the tumultuous Western Empire. And it was truly tumultuous in his time. And again, here's that map so we can see that when he was there, the Arians were more or less outnumbering the Orthodox Catholics in the West. What's his legacy? Well, he defeated Arianism, and he brought many of the clergy back to rational thought and an embrace of apostolic succession. He also rejected the machinations that were occurring in the Eastern Empire uh, when he said the emperor is in the church, not above it. But perhaps his greatest legacy was the intervention and the life of a confused young scholar, a man by the name of Augustine of Hippo. So who was St. Augustine of Hippo? Well, he was born uh, to Patricius, who was a pagan Roman, and Monica, who was a daily communicant in the Catholic Church. And he's born in the little town of Tagaste, which is about 150 miles from Carthage. So he's born on the African side of the Mediterranean uh, Sea. North Africa was off the beaten trail. Uh, all roads led to Rome, as they would say. So Patricius encouraged his son to gain an education and Augustine began his journey. So Patricia said, you got you to gotta get an education. You have to go to Rome if you're going to have a future. Well, first he went to Carthage, and he immediately began looking for love in all the wrong places. In fact, he took a mistress and had a son by her, and she lived with him for over 20 years. He had many other lovers prior to that. After his father's death, Patricia's death, Monica, his mother, began to worry about her son, and she prayed daily for his conversion. Augustine found the Catholic faith to be somewhat boring uh, and not exciting enough for him. He began to follow a group of people called the Manichaeans. Manichae was their leader, and it was, it was very much like a, a, a good God, evil God kind of religion. But, a, but by Augustine's time, the Manichaeans led to a dead end. He followed them for a long time, and he did not find the answers he was looking for, and he earnestly sought enlightenment elsewhere. So he decided to go to Rome. Monica begged him to take her along with him, and there he began teaching, but he hated the experience. And then quite unexpectedly, Augustine was asked to be a court official for the emperor, and off he went to Milan. Who's in Milan? Ambrose. So when Monica heard the news, she encouraged her son to go see the bishop of Milan, Ambrose. And this is what he wrote. That man of God, that is Ambrose, received me in fatherly fashion, and as an exemplary bishop, he welcomed my pilgrimage. I began to love him, at first not as a teacher of the truth, which I utterly despaired of finding in your church, but as a man who was kindly disposed towards me. I listened carefully to him as he preached to the people, not with the intention I should have had, but to try out his eloquence, as it were, and see whether it came up to its reputation. Well, for the next several weeks, Augustine came to Mass at the cathedral, where the Ambrosian chant and the powerful words of Ambrose's homilies slowly transformed the young man from North Africa. Augustine and his son were baptized in Milan by Ambrose, and Monica's lifelong dream had been realized, and she died shortly after that event. She prayed for her son for 25 years. Augustine then returned to Gasti in North Africa, with a group of followers who intended to live in a monastic community. He's going to set one up too. But this, uh, for Augustine, would be short-lived. What's his legacy? Well, he made the journey to Hippo to convince a friend there to come and join his community in Tecasti. But while he was recognized and drafted by the community there to become a, uh, their assistant priest and ultimately became their bishop. So he was drafted into service. Augustine would invent the concept of the autobiography with his work, The Confessions, because he wrote down his whole life experience and his whole conversion story. And if you haven't read it, find the time, read it. In 430, the year that he died, the Vandals from Europe invaded and they burned the city of Hippo. They burned a lot of the city 
but they did not burn the cathedral library. And thank God, because now the world has all the voluminous works of Augustine as a result. It's said he wrote over 5,000 books. Our next church father is St. Leo the Great. Well, Pope Leo, he earned the suffix the Great in both council warfare and courage in the face of an overwhelming army. The Arian and other heresies have been gnawing at the church for over 200 years when Leo decided that enough was enough. He sent a letter that is a papal encyclical to the council at Ephesus in 449, but the Arian supporters there blocked it being read. So at the Council of Chalcedon in 451, Leo's letter was read loudly and clearly. The letter clearly stated the orthodox uh, faith and the apostolic uh, doctrine of the incarnation of Jesus Christ and that Jesus Christ is one person with two distinct natures, divine and human, one and the same Christ, Son, Lord, only begotten, known in two natures, without confusion, without change, without division, without separation. The council heartily endorsed and subscribed to Pope Leo's teaching. Pope Leo himself rejoiced at the council's action and said, Peter has spoken through Leo and anathema to him who preaches otherwise. So Leo's picking up and building on what uh, Pope Clement I established way back in the year 99. Leo's other great moment came when he and a solitary deacon went forward to meet Attila the Hun. Attila the Hun is descending on Rome with a giant army. The barbarian leader was intent on plunder and destruction. That's what he was going to do in Rome. And Leo re- realized that the Roman citizens, they had no vigor left to defend their city. They'd already been invaded um, many times. So he relied on God's providence. And after meeting with Leo, Attila and his horde turned back, and they spared Rome. So one man turned back an entire army in the year 452. Our next church father is St. Gregory the Great. So almost as soon as the Christians became established in the West, the world began to fall apart around them. The Visigoths attacked and sacked Rome in 410. The Vandals repeated that act in 455. And the last emperor in the West died in 476. So the world felt empty and cold until the church, revitalized by the new Pope Gregory, revitalized the Vatican and Europe. So Gregory stored order and purpose to a clergy that becomes slovenly in response to the weariness of the times. He revitalized the mass, and one of his suggestions, Gregorian chant, was named after him. And Gregory believed effective preaching by pastors was the single most important task, and he wrote many manuals for their edification. He worked tirelessly, and the result was that the church was poised at the brink of the dark ages to be the solitary candle shining in the dark, shining a light of hope and reason into the gathering gloom. Our last church father is St. Isidore of Seville. Isidore was born in the year 560 in Spain, ruled by the Visigoths. The days of Rome were long gone and mostly forgotten. Spain, like much of Europe, was being redefined with the arrival of different races and tribes of people, either as conquerors or refugees from other lands that had been conquered. When Isidore became the bishop of the cathedral in Seville, he was acutely aware of the need for education as a means of bringing disparate peoples together and as a means of passing on the true faith. So his legacy was that he was a prolific author and his greatest work was called Etymologies. Uh, It was a work on the derivation and origins of words. And indeed, that's what the the word etymology means. But Etymologies uh, was still a work in progress at the time of his death, but it invented a whole new genre of of writing. The modern encyclopedias are the descendants of what he started. And Isidore is generally regarded as the last of the church fathers. A man of considerable learning, he produced a library of work that strengthened religious foundations for many years to come during the coming storm of the dark ages. So what have we learned in this? Well, we learned that the church fathers were not necessarily called to a religious life and their youth. Most experience a conversion after pursuing pursuing another life. Many were from aristocratic or wealthy families, but not all. Many were educated men and leaders of their communities. The conversion of these men, however, was total and complete, and martyrdom was not a deterrent 
as we saw with Justin and Origen and many others. They advocated following the faith as handed down by the apostles. They believed in apostolic succession, and they battled against the never-ceasing heresies that plagued the church in the first three, four, or five hundred years. They supported apostolic succession. Nearly all became saints, and many are doctors of the church. And they resisted all attacks on the church and faith. Their courage is needed again today. Church fathers, pray for us. Let us close in prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Thanks for listening. Peace be with you.